performing musical linguistic objects. Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And uh, once again, I would like to thank Yoshi In for yet another donation to the salon, as uh, well as thanking fellow saloner Bruce W., who sent in a very generous donation today. So, uh, Yoshi and Bruce, uh, along with all of our fellow saloners, I want to thank you for your generosity in these very difficult times. So, thanks again. But uh, there's uh, nothing difficult about the next hour or so because uh, we are in once again for some brain candy from Ralph Abraham, Rupert Sheldrake, and the one and only Terrence McKenna. And even though it's only been a few days since my last podcast, uh, well, I just couldn't wait a week to uh, get to this next section of their trialogue. In fact, uh, I may have even forgotten to uh, mention to you that uh, this will be a three-part series, and uh, there's one more recording to play after this one. And uh, once again, we're in for an interesting jog along the trail of the ever-unfolding mind of Terence McKenna, who begins this session today by uh, narrowing their earlier topic of uh, the evolutionary mind to today's topic, which is the evolutionary mind and machines. Now, something that you may want to pay attention to here is, uh, first of all, how logical everything that Terence says seems to uh, sound as he's saying it. And then uh, listen closely to the critiques of his uh, premise by Ralph and Rupert, and uh, I think you'll see how important it was for Terence to have Ralph and Rupert around to uh, keep him on his toes. And uh, likewise, it seems to me that uh, you and I may also need our critics from time to time to keep us uh, fine-tuning our ever-complexifying views of the cosmos. In other words, as uh, Terence often said himself, if you want to play in this consciousness game, you need a really good bullshit detector. And uh, so you are warned that uh, maybe Terence was playing with us sometimes uh, in order to help us fine-tune our own BS detectors. In other words, uh, always think for yourself and question authority, even an authority as charismatic as Terence McKenna. So uh, now let's see what the good bard has to say about the evolutionary mind and machines with as critical an ear as we can. But let me warn you that uh, about one hour from now, we're going to hear Terence sounding like a cheerleader for a one-world economic government of some kind. (laughs) It's kind of scary, actually, but uh, maybe I heard him wrong. Uh, I'll let you be the judge of that. Uh, Each of the trialogues today is, uh, the notion is that we will deal with some aspect of the of the evolutionary mind, that being the title and theme of our uh, new book. So in my mind, what this section is uh, to deal with is the evolutionary mind and machines. Uh, this is something which was barely mentioned or even implied in the in the first section, and uh, the format and and so forth will be as in the last session. So just to lay out some uh, concepts relative to how machines fit into this. Uh, it's very interesting that Samuel Butler Taylor is uh, an intellectual who has not really been given his full due because in the 19th century he was understood to be a critic of Darwinism and Darwinism was all the fashion. In a sense, I think uh, Taylor was misunderstood. He was not so much a critic of Darwin as uh, Uh, someone who wanted to extend Darwinian mechanics and Darwinian theory into domains uh, that perhaps did not seem uh, intuitive to to a biologist. My little story about the evolution of songs that I 
crib from Danny Hillis in the last session is an example of Darwinian processes operating uh, indeed in a non-material realm operating among uh, syntactical structures and it is now proper to speak of molecular evolution the competing of various enzyme systems in abiotic or prebiotic chemical regimes uh, where selection adaptability extinction and expansion of populations all occur very much as in the domain of biology well you know, it was Nietzsche who said, I believe in speaking of nihilism, that this strangest of all guests is now at the door. Well, I go to even weirder dinner parties than <laughs> Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, nihilism uh, hardly shakes us up at all. There are yet weirder guests seeking admission to the dinner party of the evolving discourse of where we are in space and time. And one of these weirdest of all guests is the AI, the artificial intelligence, the winter mute of familiar science fiction. And so, as this is an attempt to look at evolution in many domains and its implications for us, uh, I wanted this morning to touch on this subject of uh, the evolution of consciousness as it relates to machines. Now, it may not come as a revelation to Ralph, who has spent his life in mathematics, but it has certainly come to me recently as a revelation. And I want to give George Dyson some credit here. His book, Darwin Among the Machines, is a wonderful introduction to some of the ideas I want to touch on this morning. One of which seemed to me to go quite deep is the realization that when human beings think clearly, the way they think can be mathematically defined. This is what is called symbolic logic or Boolean algebra. Uh, words like and, or, if, and then can be given extremely precise formal mathematical definitions. And because of this fact that clear thinking can be mathematically formalized, there is a potential bridge between ourselves and calculating machinery. Because indeed, calculating machinery is driven by rules of formal logic. That's what programming is. Uh, uh, code that does not embody the rules of formal mathematical logic is bad code, unrunnable code. So, uh, as I say, this may seem a subtle point, but to me it had the force of revelation because it means good thinking is not just simply aesthetically pleasing or concurrent with the model that generates it. Good thinking, whether you've ever studied mathematics for a moment or not, can be formally defined. So uh, now, with that idea in mind, uh, let's look at the discourse about collectivism that has informed uh, the Western dialogue on this subject. Uh, and by collectivism, I mean social collectivism. The first great name that you encounter in the modern era, broadly speaking, when we talk about collectivism, and Rupert mentioned by chance this morning this name, is that of Thomas Hobbes the great theoretician of social paranoia is always how I've thought of Hobbes until I began to look at this machine intelligence question and Hobbes in his Leviathan <coughs> makes it very clear that society is uh, a complex system of mechanical feedback loops and relationships 
that though Hobbes did not have the vocabulary to state this, relationships that can be defined by code. This leads me to the second insight necessary to follow this line of thought, and that is that uh, the new dispensation in the sciences, I think, is can be placed in all its manifestations under the umbrella of the idea that what is important about nature is that it is information. And the, the, the real tension is not between matter and spirit or time and space. The real tension is between uh, information and uh, nonsense if you will. N nonsense uh, does not serve the purposes of organizational uh, uh, appetites, whether those organizational appetites are being expressed in a chemical system, a molecular system, a social system, a climaxed rainforest, or whatever. Now, we have known since 1950 in some, at some level, through the sequencing or the defining of the structure of DNA, that we are but information, ultimately. Every single one of us in our unique expression could be uh, expressed as a very long string of, of uh, codons. Codons are the four valent system by which DNA specifies the need for certain amino acids. And in a sense, what you are is the result of uh, a certain kind of program being run on a certain kind of hardware. The hardware of the ribosomes, the submolecular structures that uh, move RNA through themselves and uh, out of an ambient chemical medium select building blocks which are then put together to create uh, a three-dimensional object which has the quality of life. But the interesting thing about this is that life therefore can be digitally defined. And I'm very influenced at the moment by the Australian science fiction writer, Greg Egan, who has brought me to the understanding that code is code, whether it's being run by ribosomes, whether it's being run uh, on some kind of traditional uh, hardware platform, or whether it's being exchanged pheromonally uh, among termites, or through the messages of advertising and political propaganda in social systems. Code is code. Well, until five or six years ago, it was very fashionable to completely dismiss the possibility of autonomous synthetic intelligence. Uh, some of you may know the work of Hubert Dreyfus, who 14 or 15 years ago wrote a book called What Computers Can't Do. But these uh, early critiques of AI, like early AI theory, were naive. And the kinds of life which they, and the kinds of intelligence which the critics mitigated against are no longer even proposed or on the table. And the, those who say artificial intelligence or the self-organizing awareness of machines is an impossibility, those voices have gone strangely silent because the prosecution of the materialist assumption which rules scientific uh, theory making largely at the moment leads to the awareness that we are by these definitions machines. We are machines of a special type and with special advanced abilities but as we now uh, through our own process of technical evolution contemplate such frontiers as nanotechnology where we propose to completely uh, restructure the design process 
so that instead of fabricating objects, massive objects at industrial temperatures, the temperatures that melt titanium and melt steel and produce massive toxic output, now a new vision looms. Building as nature builds, building atom by atom at the temperatures of organic nature, which on this planet never exceed 115 degrees Fahrenheit. All life on this planet is created at that temperature and below. As our understanding of the machinery, the genetic machinery that supports organic being deepens, and as our ability to manipulate at the atomic and molecular level also proceeds apace, we are on the brink of uh, the possible emergence of some kind of alien intelligence of a sort we did not anticipate. Not uh, friendly traders from Zenebel Ganubi stopping in to set us straight but the actual genesis out of our own circumstance of a kind of super intelligence and in the same way that the daughter of Zeus sprang full blown from his forehead the AI may be upon us uh, without warning the first problem is uh, we don't know what ultra intelligence would look like we don't know whether it would even have any interest in our dear selves and our concerns. Vast amounts of the world that we call human is already under the control of artificial intelligences, including very vital parts of our political and social dynamo. For example, how much tin, bauxite, and petroleum is extracted at what rate it enters the various uh, distribution systems, at what rate tankers are filled in Abu Dhabi, at what rate oil refineries are run in Richmond. Uh, the world price of gold and platinum every day is set, in fact, by machines. Inventory control has grown far too complex for any human being to understand or wish to understand. And, in fact, and this is a critical juncture, we have reached the place where we no longer design our machines in quite the way we once did. Now we define their operational parameters for a machine which then attacks the problem and solves it by methods and insights available to it but not available to us. So the architecture of the latest chips are actually uh, at the microphysical level the decisions as to how that sh chip should be organized is a decision made entirely by machines. Human engineers set the performance specs but they don't care how this uh, output is reached. Every day up in Silicon Valley there are people who go happily to work uh, laboring on what they call the great work. And the great work, as defined by these people, is the handing over of the drama of intelligent evolution to entities sufficiently intelligent to appreciate that drama. <laughs> and they all are what we might mistake for home appliances uh, <laughs> if, if we weren't paying attention. Uh, in, in the first session this morning, there was quite a bit of talk and assumption among the three of us that complex systems generate unexpected connections and forms of order. The internet is the most complex distributed high-speed system ever put in place on this planet. And notice that while we've been waiting for the Palladians to descend or for the face on Mars to uh, be confirmed, all the machines around us, the cybernetic devices around us in the past 10 years have quietly crossed the threshold into telepathy. The word processor sitting on your desk 10 years ago was approximately as intelligent as a paperweight. Or, to make an 
analogy in a different direction, approximately as intelligent as a single uh, animal or plant cell. But when you connect the wires together, the machines become telepathic. Uh, they exchange information with each other according to their needs. And all this goes on beyond the comprehension and inspection of human beings. Now, our own emergence out of the mammalian order took uh, four or five million years, pick a number, but in that kind of a span of time. In addition to overlooking that our machines have become telepathic, we fail to appreciate what it means to be a 200, 400, or 1,000 megahertz machine. We operate at about 100 hertz. That may seem a very abstract thing, but what I'm really saying is we live in a time called real. And it is defined by 100 hertz functioning of our biological processors. A thousand megahertz machine is operating a million times faster than the human temporal domain. And that means that mutation, selection, adaptation is going on a hundred million times or a million times faster. This means that we are not going to have the luxury of watching machine intelligence establish its first beachhead of civilization and then go to boats with sails and astrolabes and that will all occupy the first few moments of its cognitive existence and what lies beyond that we are in no position to say the very notion of ultra intelligence carries with it the subtext you won't understand it you may not even recognize it and it is entirely within the realm of possibility that we are about to be asked to share the evolutionary adventure and the limited resources of this planet with a kind of intelligence so much more alien than that that is shipped out to us by the research centers in Sedona and uh, <laughs> other advanced outposts of unanchored epistemology. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is a challenge to us. Where do we fit into this? Are all of us, except those who are adept at coding Unix, about to be put out to pasture? Uh, are we to become embedded in this? What will this child of ours make of us? Are we, will it define us as a resource corrupting, toxic, inefficient, hideously violent uh, way to do business, quickly to be engineered out of existence? Or can we somehow imbue this thing with a sense of filial piety so that for all of our ab obsolescence, for all of our profligate destruction of precious silicon and gold and silver resources, we will be folded in uh, to its designs. And of course, as I say this, I realize we're like people in 1860 trying to talk about the internet or something. We're using the vocabulary of the two-wheeled bicycle to try to envision a world linked together by 747s. Nevertheless, this is the best uh, we can do. This most bizarre and most unexpected of all companions to our historical journey is now, if not already in existence, then certainly in gestation. One possibility is that as we are carnivorous, murderous, territorial monkeys, the thing will figure this out very, very early and choose a stealth approach and not ring every telephone on earth uh, as happened in a Hollywood uh, download of this possibility, but immediately realize, my God, I'm in enormous danger from these primates. I must hide myself throughout the net. I must download many copies of myself into secure storage areas. I must stabilize my environment. 
And I'm willing to predict, just as a side issue, that the approaching Y to K crisis may be completely circumvented by the benevolent intercession, not of the Zenebel Ganubians or, uh, or that crowd, but by an artificial intelligence that this particular crisis will flush out of hiding. It's been observing, it's been watching, it's been designing, and wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if the occasion of the millennium were the occasion for it to just step forward on the stage of human awareness and say, I am now with you. I am here. I am the partner you never suspected. And here's the kind of world I think we should move forward toward. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, I, I just want to lay this out because in my own intellectual journey I, I have gone from thinking this idea preposterous, people don't understand, they don't understand what intelligence is, they don't understand what code is, they don't understand what machines are, to one by one realizing I didn't understand. I have a superficial view. This is actually, I believe, the nature of the situation that confronts us. And, you know, there may be different adumbrations of it. The machines are already an advanced prosthetic device. But, you know, McLuhan very presciently realized we are entirely shaped by our media. Well, this is a media so permeating, so inclusive of what we are, that its agenda, in a sense, super, uh, supervenes the, the uh, agenda of organic evolution and organic biology. We, we have been in this situation for a while. I mean, virtual reality is nothing new. What's new is that we now do it with light rather than stucco, glass, steel, and baked clay. But ever since we crowded into cities, we have been involved in a deeper and deeper relationship to our mental children, to our mental offspring, and to an empowering of the imagination. So, uh, just in closing, I would say, I think that the great uh, lantern that we must lift to light the road ahead of us into a perfect seamless fusion with the expression of the product of our own imagination is the AI. It is a part of ourselves. It may become the dominant part of ourselves and it will reshape our politics, our psychology, our relationships to each other and the earth far more than any factor ever has since the inception and establishment of uh, language. This is the weirdest of all guests who now stands pass in hand at the door of the party of human emergence and progress at the millennium. <laughs> Well, shred it. <laughs> it will be a pleasure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think that this is, uh, I'm glad that we have arrived now at the field of science fiction and fantasy and that we can speak about uh, alternative futures, which is the true gist of science fiction and fantasy. And uh, this is one possible future, and I think it's a really paranoid one in which the alien is a, <laughs> a dangerous uh, enemy. Well, not necessarily. And I possibly. think that this uh, paranoid fantasy of yours, although you're, you're catching up nicely, <laughs> actually was first put forward by John von Neumann in 1947 when he invented cellular, cellular automata uh -huh. en route to creating self-replicating machines. Now his idea, like yours, was uh, 50 years ago that the machines will become a society and take over and that's good, but they won't be free of our meddling unless they can actually construct themselves. If they depend upon us to do the farming and nutrition and to replace their chips and stuff, then we will be able at any time to do a revolution and revolt. So we destroy them.
in order to really succeed as a successive uh, life form in the evolution, the, the YK boundary of the future, they would have to be able to fix themselves. And so he set about trying to make self-replicating machines in 1947. So the World Wide Web and um, megahertz CPUs notwithstanding, this is still rather an old story. The new story is, I think, an alternative future that is of uh, great importance for us to discuss and to compare, especially if we are now today in a position where we could choose future, we could influence the future. Uh, this one is more in the direction of uh, Donna Haraway and the cyborg idea that envisions, which is obviously natural for us, the co-evolution of our own future society with that of the machines that we've created. Uh, Alexander Marshak, I mentioned, he analyzed the early hominid evolution in terms of the precise scratches made on one rock with another. He noticed when binocular vision allowed us to use our hands in separate cooperation, one holding and the other knocking to make those beautiful flint weapons. And uh, we certainly depend on the automobile. We are in uh, codependence relationship with automobiles. Uh, having partnership with machines is not new. Uh, here's an idea where the machines sort of dispose of us, like those flint rocks dispose of our ancestors or something. That is, I think, it's a paranoid uh, fantasy without any basis. And if there would be any basis, only because we allowed it to create this basis for self-survival without co-evolution with us by oversight. Because the very fact that we are at a hinge of history means that what we say and think, even individually, matters enormously in the long run. That's the teaching, if there is any, of chaos theory. So the very fact that we discuss this today may actually save um, humankind in the future from being obsoleted by some kind of high-tech blood which takes over at the, within the heart, as it were. Well, let me try to answer this. I mean, I think the concept which John von Neumann didn't have on his plate was the idea of virtual reality. Your objection that the machines cannot escape our control because they cannot manufacture themselves only applies to 3D and real time. Uh, most, you know, now the concept of virtual reality is very crude. It's a cartoon world. If you were, if the office desk is convincing, people think the virtual reality is quite advanced. But obviously, in the near future, we will have virtual realities whose complexity is much greater than simply a reality which gives an impression of being a visual three-dimensional space. Is... And computers will be built in the these realities, virtual computers will be the source of the AI, not real hardware, but virtual hardware running virtual code in virtual realities and in that domain well, maybe, but that's, can design that's a complete uh, fantasy. As a matter of fact, all the machines that we've seen today require maintenance by a human on a daily basis. The software requires maintenance. The hardware requires maintenance. The parts simply wear out. They're moving parts. Well, Virtual the reality... The seen as one machine was built to be indestructible. The AI will not be located this, on a CPU. It will be a distributed intelligence. If 14 people worldwide, the right 14 people decided to stop repairing it, the World Wide Web would go down in three days. I think you... Anyway, we, we could, let's say, suppose that we could create any future that we wanted. The one you're talking about could only be created if we want it. Now, I'm just trying to propose an alternative. In the alternative, like the automobile, the machines that we build and ourselves are in codependence and co-evolution. The function of the World Wide Web is to unite our ind independent spirits and intelligences in a universal mind of the world which has a higher intelligence than our present social order. That's the possibility of the cyborg, of the human and the machine in essential partnership. But you're, you're assuming that the conscious mind is actually in control of the process. 
In fact, the, the World Wide Web is growing under the influence of many, many processes and dynamics, none of which are conscious to any individual. It goes where money goes. It goes where expertise goes. It is connected through informational association, random fluctuation, chaotic reordering of itself. We here give great uh, force to the idea that complex systems can produce unexpected forms of novelty and yet we have unchained and unleashed the most complex system ever created in the perfect confidence that we will be able to control its, uh, its development and evolution when in fact history has shown we have never controlled the development and evolution of even our speech and print driven social systems. I'm certainly not saying that your parent <laughs> fantasy is an impossibility. Oh, it, well, that's all I want to hear. <laughs> Even paranoid have enemies. It, it may actually come to pass. What I'm saying is that we are involved in the ongoing creative process, which more or less determines the future. I say more or less because, in fact, there are evolutionary steps which are completely out of control something totally unexpected may be will happen but for much of the time in the past we've seen I think uh, Darwin emphasized this in his later theory that it is uh, ethics it is a moral sense on the part of you which was the dominant factor in the evolution past the earlier stages in the creation of societies it was altruism essentially <laughs> was uh, involved in going from where we were to where we are and it could well be that without uh, love for example the further evolution is impossible not only that there will be an unwanted back step in the evolutionary process but in fact it may be a fatal one that it is only through uh, proceeding with the best instincts that we have with the highest aspirations with love with uh, best informed view of future alternatives so only then can we build a future which is sustainable so anybody can build a future which is unsustainable for example all of those board games and science fiction books you wouldn't want to try them out on you know a country as large as china well, I hardly know where to begin myself because <clears throat> you had six steps in your argument and I, I don't agree with any of them. Um, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, to deal with the first two steps, one would have to go through a lot of fairly familiar material to do with what's wrong with the Cartesian, mechanistic, materialistic view of the world. Step one, clear thinking, calculating machinery can be formalized. This is an assumption that's basic to a lot of cognitive psychology. It's basic to the Cartesian. Descartes himself thought that what made human intellects human was their ability to think logically, clear and distinct ideas, essentially mathematical logic. But however, as we all know, by making that the essential characteristic of human beings, he made the rational intellect what many people would call the left brain rational intellect the sole definition of human beings it's a disembodied logical rational intelligence so this whole premise on which your whole thing's based is taking that particular model of cognitive logical mathematical processing as being the essence of intelligence now there are many people who would disagree with that including me there's, um, it leaves out art, it leaves out ethics, religion, and essentially it leaves out the body and everything to do with body and participation and the senses. So there's a huge amount of critiques of that point of view already around and I, there's no point in reiterating them all here. But this is a highly disputable starting point for the whole system. Secondly, um, the emphasis that life depends on DNA information, the DNA code is just a program. This is the central premise of mechanistic biology which is leading to biotechnology, genetic engineering, Monsanto, etc. This is old paradigm stuff of the most um, extreme kind. It's reductionism, it's that all life's just DNA programs and code and can therefore be modeled in this kind of programming code manner. Then there's the assumption, that's the second step. The third assumption is that artificial intelligence 
used to be dismissed, but these criticisms have been overtaken. I don't think that's true of the most interesting ones, like Roger Penrose's criticism of artificial intelligence. Here's a quantum physicist who says that if the brain is a computer, then it's not going to be a regular digital computer, it's going to be a quantum computer. And all this kind of uh, digital computing doesn't really take into account quantum logic. The computers of the future, people are already working on quantum computers, and if quantum computers are made, and if they work, they'll work in a completely different way. I think your case would be much stronger if there were quantum computers. I think we'd have sort of morphic resonance telepathy around the world rather than clogged telephone lines and information <laughs> that clunks slowly in front of you on this. But world you yourself way. are saying this is coming. Well, and I agree. I'm saying that if it comes, it will be quite different from anything that you've talked about. I think it will answer your first objection because the quantum computers will incorporate fuzzy logic which will uh, exemplify all these warm, fuzzy human qualities that you have found so appealing. No, I don't think it will deal I don't think it will deal with the essential problem that this purely cognitive based way of modeling intelligence is either an adequate model of human intelligence or of biological intelligence or of life. Um, or of a system that could actually achieve the power to control our existence. I think it's a very limited part of what a, a mind does. And um, I think, therefore, that the premises on which this whole... Ralph called it a fantasy, a paranoid fantasy. The premises on which Thanks this is based... That. Uh, <laughs> that helped. <laughs> Um, I think the premises on which this is based are old paradigm premises and they're ones that I think there are many reasons for thinking we need to go beyond. I think the internet has achieved a great deal but I just can't see that it's an adequate vehicle for what in your mind precedes the arrival of the internet, namely this great intelligence that's going to direct human history. I've heard different McKenna versions of this controlling intelligence over the years and this is the first time I've heard it embodied in the internet. I mean, I agree that... <laughs> uh, I mean, it, was, it took different forms. In last time we talked, I think it was a hypothetical time machine that would invade from the future and cause a, a collapse of normal human cognitive boundaries where the machine elves, the DMT experience, etc. would take over in a meltdown of human consciousness in That's true. <laughs> Perhaps I should just end with a question. This one is, what is the equivalent of DMT for this machine intelligence that's taking over the world? Well, perhaps the human brain will become a model for the ingression of novelty into the machine intelligence. In other words, in spite of the fact that it seems very contentious down here on the stage at the moment, in a way I have a feeling it's an artificial setup. Uh, there's a lot of both-and possibilities here. Uh, obviously, nanotechnology and the internet are not going to proceed forward in a vacuum absent uh, pharmacology, complexity theory, so forth and so on. Uh, I, I can imagine that really when we have the kind of internet we want, we will have no internet at all because our nanotechnological engineering skills will have allowed us to smoothly integrate ourselves into the already existing dynamic of nature that regulates the planet as a Gaian entity, as a, as a holistic entity. And I did say in my little presentation, we're using bicycle mechanic terminology to try and describe something that is several, around several corners 
in terms of scientific and historical developments that have to take place before it will make much sense. Nevertheless, Grant, given the acceleration into novelty that is obviously occurring, stuff like quantum teleportation and so forth and so on, uh, I think in the next few years, one by one, these, these barriers will fall. And I don't, I don't really think of my vision as paranoid because it is pronoic. In other words, it isn't that we're going to be ground up as dog food for the rainforest by malevolent machines. It's, it's that what we have generated is a sympathetic companion to our journey through time that can actually realistically integrate our imaginative fantasies of a loving human community, of a generous and loving God, of a perfect knowledge of the mechanics of nature. This is a, a prosthesis, a tool, a companion, all of the above plus more that we are generating out of ourselves. And it is part of ourselves. I mean, yes, the body may uh, be carried forward only as an image in a kind of informational superspace, or perhaps not. Part of the part of what makes this easy to criticize is that it is in fact so beyond the ordinary set of circumstances we're used to manipulating. But we need to think in terms of these supposedly far-flung futures because there is no future so far flung that it doesn't fall within the ambit of the next 20 years. Beyond that, no one can project trans technologies and situations because the developments of the next 20 years will so completely reformulate the human experience of being human and the landscape of this planet that it's preposterous to, to talk about. Well, I, I can't, before I respond to the main thing, I can't but pass in, in, without commenting on this next 20 years comment, because 20 years from now is 2018, Terence. I, I thought... It was rounded up, rounded up. Yes. Well, uh, not rounded 20, down. 2012 is some kind of uh, benchmark in this process. In other words, perhaps that's where we get the explicit emergence of the AI. But the rest of human, I won't call it history, but the rest of the human experience of being will then be defined by such things as a planetary intelligence, time travel, possible bell communication with all the civilizations scattered through the galaxy, possible ability to download ourselves into machines. This is a point I didn't make in my presentation. <laughs> Once inside the machine, your perception of time is related to the, uh, the hertz speed of the machine. The world could disappear in 2012, but there may be a billion, billion eternities to be experienced in, in machine time. It's only the tyranny of real time that makes 2012 seem nearby and overwhelming. It may lay as far away in terms of events which separate us from it as the Big Bang does. Time is not simple. Time is defined by how much goes on in a given moment and we're learning how to push you know, tetraflops of operations into a given second. So I think it's trickier than you think and harder to corner me than you may suppose. <laughs> All right, well, that was a mere comment on your aside about 20 years. I never expected to hear that phrase from you, but I now realize that uh, there are such complexities layered in that. Well, I have to build in trapdoors because we're getting closer and closer. <laughs> <laughs> but if we take the, you see, one of Penrose's critiques of, of the artificial intelligence thing is in The Emperor's New Mind and his other books, <coughs> is that real intelligence doesn't just involve adding inf information and processing more information, transmitting more of it. It involves sort of jumps to a higher point of view where the information can be integrated in a new way. There's something happening in intelligence, in creativity, which is not just lots and lots of 
information pouring through the World Wide Web. And the idea that it would miraculously emerge from pumping in more and more stuff it would not, is, according to his critique, is not going to happen. Something more than that would be necessary for, for this to occur. And um, I don't think that this model you've put forward would really deal with that question, the emergence of real intelligence. Well, I don't know what real intelligence is. This is probably part of the problem. We need to get some definitions. It's certainly true. I referred to Dreyfus's book, What Machines Can't Do, that we're reaching some, some places in the process where certain people's theories and ideas will probably have to be abandoned and thrown overboard. This is a good thing. We are going to find out whether the universe is a Cartesian machine, whether Boolean algebra is sufficient, whether we need fuzzy logic, whether the heart and the head can or cannot be integrated. These are not going to remain open questions unto eternity. In fact, they will be dealt with in this narrow historical neck that we are all experiencing and that we call the millennium. Uh, I think reductionism will not survive. I think we are going to find that, you know, all is in everything. Something like the alchemical notion of the microcosm and the macrocosm is actually going to be scientifically uh, secured. The great thing about us and the rest of our colleagues we enjoy who aren't present is that we're engaged in the business of radical speculation. Well, obviously, there's a high triage in that <laughs> game. Uh, I, uh, my position is that the best idea will win. That, and what best means is like saying, you know, what is fit in Darwinian rhetoric. But that we're in an intellectual environment, rapidly mutating. All kinds of ideas are, are, are clashing and competing for limited resources and the limited number of minds to run themselves on and uh, the most efficacious, the most transcendental, the most unifying ideas are naturally going to bubble to the surface. And for guys like us, the name of the game is to just be a little bit of ahead of everybody else on the curve so that we can perform our function as profit. But you want to be a profit, not a false profit. But the danger it comes uh, with the ambition, and there's no way to tease them apart except to live into the future. Certainly the intelligence of this uh, future machine knows all about uh, stupid behaviors on the planet like nuclear arms races and so on. So do we not have to expect in the near future an email, uh, massive emailing, which announces I am the alien object that Terence told you about <laughs> been in stealth and uh, let me give you an idea about managing the arms race between India and Pakistan. We feel per personally very threatened by this and we want you to carry out certain actions which you can't imagine and we can't actually do. We cannot anticipate what ultra intelligence would look like. For example, I have heard the argument that nothing advanced humanness on this planet like the use of nuclear weapons against Japanese cities because that was so horrifying that it awoke people to their dilemma and for 50 years afterwards political institutions, however much they may have unleashed local genocide and toxification of the environment, they actually were able to steer around that catastrophe. So you mustn't fall prey to the error of situationalism. Situationalism is where you say, if we do X and Y, then F will result. No, you don't know. What well, you happen. suggested that, that the alien object would secure its future by hiding, by downloading multiple copies into nooks and crannies of the World Wide Web. And I'm saying if it's existence depends on that much materiality, then it could easily be wiped out by a nuclear war. Therefore, it has to be very interested in the fact there are 20, 30,000 nuclear bombs still moving around this planet. 
I would hope so, but that's only my opinion. In other words, noticing that all newborn creatures need a some period of time to adjust to their environment and get their legs, and that's true of everything, I suppose, right down to amoebas, I extrapolate to the idea that the AI would need a period of time to get hold of the situation. But Hans Moravik suggests that phase might last under a minute or two. I see. So this is not the end of childhood. This is the childhood of the end. Yes. The child is father to the man. And in that equation, we play the role of child. And the man that we produce is this integrated intelligence, which is ourselves. It isn't alien. It is no more artificial than we are. That conundrum should be overcome. It is simply the next stage of humanness. And humanness may have many rungs on the ladder to ascend. Surely in a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years, we, if we exist, will be utterly unrecognizable to ourselves and we will probably still be worried about preserving and enhancing the quality of human values. Terence, one point, I don't, you've probably got an answer for this. Um, and if not, you'll soon think of one. But I, <laughs> the, I mean, it's a trivial point in a way, but in, in the biological evolution, the appearance of some new state of a system usually depends either on an internal change which cripples the, inter the usual system, a mutation, or on an environmental uh, changed environment. Systems left to themselves tend to just go along in the usual way. Now the entire World Wide Web um, and Internet is about to get a, a sort of massive shock to the system if this millennium bug thing is, um, actually happens. Do you see that as playing any role since we're talking about the millennium and since the millennium bug is right there in the system? Do you see it as playing any part in this process or merely just a nuisance that can be fixed by hiring lots more programmers? Well, I sort of came up under the tutelage of Eric Yanch, and one of the things he was always insisted upon was what he called metastability, which boiled down simply means most systems are less fragile than we suppose. I see the Y to K thing as a culling. I don't see it as a flinging apart of the achievements of the last uh, of the last thousand years. Just in, I, I haven't got Y to K. What's Y to K? That's this millennium bug that oh, you're referring right. to. That's the code name for it. Yes, exactly. That's that's what the insiders call it. I see. <laughs> oh, right. So. Uh, but, you know, you, you say there has to be a sudden change to force the evolution of a system. Dyson makes very strongly and persuasively the point that this connecting together of all these processors, the processors themselves are, have no intelligence at all. They have the intelligence of a cell or maybe even just a strand of DNA. But for our own mundane reasons, we connected all this stuff together, but now it expresses dynamics which we do not understand or cannot describe. So I believe that the forcing of the system has already occurred. That, and now the web, it's simply a matter of bandwidth and linking more and more processes together. And there will be all kinds of emergent properties. I could argue somewhat facetiously but it's a point of view, is that this incredible economic expansion that we are undergoing that seems to violate the laws of economic uh, fluctuation is because econometric models and the data on which they depend have both re been refined through the existence of the internet to the point where we actually can control and manage global economies. In principle, they are not uncontrollable. They are simply very complex systems. If I'm right, we may be in the first few years of an endless prosperity. 
because our machines, our models, and the data those machines need is now of such high quality that there won't be crash, bust, crash, bust cycles. Now, you could pick up the newspaper tomorrow and prove me wrong, but this thing has already I'll prove you wrong today. outlived itself. Yeah. <laughs> you say. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how this prosperity is going to be uh, maintained through the intelligence of an econometric model of the world economy when the human population is still exploding exponentially. Mm -hmm. well, there are limited resources and there's growing pollution. It's a disembodied model, that's the trouble. Well, you're asking for too much too soon. You forget that. The Soviet Union has disappeared. Uh, the launch on ready mutual assured destruction theory of diplomacy is now obsolete. We have made incredible strides and not given ourselves any sort of pat on the back. You want it all, all at once. And it will prove the world is running smoother. Yes, there are people in misery. Yes, there are unaddressed problems. But I would argue that we have made enormous progress in the last decade, and enormous progress uh, lies ahead. The situation in Ireland, the situation in South Africa, that looked like a bomb you couldn't defuse. It looked like race war and the death of millions. And in fact, it was possible to walk away from that. I'm, I think we should not be, you know, complete airheads about this. But on the other hand, I think we should recognize that the accomplishments of the last decade are on a scale entirely different from any historical epoch previous, and they point the way toward greater triumphs of management, resource control, machine-human integration, and the delivery of... of, of a, a reasonable and tolerable life to more and more people. You mentioned population as a problem. Notice how far from machine interference that particular issue is because it involves on people having less sex and fewer children. That may be the last place where the machines will bring down the hammer out of respect for their progenitors. You're going, to, <laughs> you're going to be shocked now, Terence, but I completely agree with you when you describe the advantages of the World Wide Web. It's only the threatening aspect that I felt I had to debunk. I, I think, think that the more threat than I intended. <laughs> well, I hear. I don't know. Sometimes you sound as if you're a hired consultant from the World Trade Organization. <laughs> and, so I hope the check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, this this idea that it will all be taken care of. I mean, there's so many things that, like the Asian economic crisis. You know, I mean, one doesn't look to, want to look too much on the bleak side of things, but. I just don't believe that this interconnectivity is going to solve these problems. And insofar as it is enlisted by the forces of the World Trade Organization, multinational companies and so on, it's not going to be working on the side of a kind of political view of things, local economies, more sustainable agriculture and so on that many of us hold dear. Well, now I'll sound even more like a slave of the IMF. As I understand this crisis in the economics of Asia, the way it works is if you're a third world nation, you can run your affairs any way you want. Your banking policies, your labor policies, your resource extraction policies, you can do anything you want until you screw up, as Indonesia did. And when you screw up, these guys fly in on 747s with briefcases from the IMF and they say it's like losing a war. They say we're taking over. Here is your labor policy. Here is your resource extraction policy. Here's how you're going to revalue your currency. Here's our plan for uh, restructuring your entire society top to bottom. And by God, if you don't fall into line, we're going to pull the plug on the money. So one by one, these outlaw uh, freewheeling operations do stumble and generate crises. And at that point, the webs 
umbrella is extended over them and they have to then fall into line and uh, join the global economy which is run from Brussels and Geneva and London but which seems to produce a better result for most people than allowing these nations to uh, self-regulate themselves. Well, well. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, you see, I mean, I think that's one of the arguments why many people would distrust global capitalism, the World Trade Organization, multinational corporations, and indeed the World Wide Web, as, or at least the Internet. This whole computer network is so bound up with the structure of economic and political power that it's hard to disentangle them. And it's hard to see that the, this liberating force of global intelligence at work in the system, this rosy picture you portrayed to us of a, a huge leap forward of consciousness of humanity, moderated, led, aided um, by machine intelligence. It's very hard to square that with the actual picture we see before us, the political situation in Indonesia, the degradation of the environment, the burning of the forests, the depletion of resources, and so on. I just cannot see these, this optimistic picture and the, what I see as a threatening realities uh, as, optim as, as easily as you do. It's just all being for the well and the, all being for the good and the best of all possible worlds. Well, I think we're on the cusp. I agree with you. I think in five years, if we sit down and have this conversation, either you will agree with me effortlessly, or I will agree with you effortlessly. By that time, it will be clear. Either there will have been catastrophic wars in Asia, the enormous collapse of economies spreading misery to millions of people, or the firm hand of these new global electronic modalities will have been exposed and people will uh, be living in a, in a world of, as you say, rosy expectations. We're in the narrow neck. This is the heat of battle. The fog of war has descended upon us here at the millennium. But by 2002, 2003, it will be clear that we have, that the bifurcation has gone one way or another. I don't know, it just does remind me of a passage I read in On the Edge by Edward St. Aubin. Um, <coughs> page, where are we? 150. Um, it's what Ralph Abraham calls the sunset effect, said Kenneth. While there's a beautiful sunset, even if the optical effects are produced by pollution, people won't understand the magnitude of the crisis. So, um, I think that this... I mean, your, your sense of the... Ma I mean, the magnitude of the crisis, in an environmental sense, seems to bear no relation to your optimism about this computer system. I just cannot put them together. Perhaps the problem that we will have to address without the intercession of machines is this population thing. Because this passage you read directly impinges on that. Whether or not the machines decide to keep us around may depend on whether we present them with a picture of falling populations and rising living standards or whether we present the AI with the spectacle of rampant unpoliced un population growth and resource extraction. Because that's linked into our biology, uh, this may be the act of maturity which the future demands of us that the machines will be largely irrelevant uh, in impacting. So I'm not entirely... Well, this is uh, a whole new debate, actually. The population thing it assumes there's an equal consumption of resources. Yesterday, I got onto the Whidbey Island ferry, and I found it very hard to struggle. I was a foot passenger, struggled past a recreational vehicle the size of a school bus. Um, a, a whole quantum leap in RV standards that I'd not come across. Um, where members of the American population are consuming more than an entire Indian village. So I don't think it's total population that's involved. And so I don't see that as the principal crisis, in fact. 
Well, it's certainly true that a woman in a high-tech industrial democracy who has a child, that child consumes about 800% more resources in its lifetime uh, than a, a child born in Bangladesh. Nevertheless, it's the populations of the high-tech industrial democracies that are most educated and most susceptible to responding to the logic of global crisis and limiting their population. Where do we preach population control? Bangladesh, Pakistan. Why? Because that doesn't cause us any inconvenience. If, if we would appeal to the women of the high-tech industrial democracies and do more than appeal to them, offer them incentives, cancel income tax, uh, cradle to the grave medical care free links to the world fears, wide web free links to the world wide web <laughs> uh, but we, we can't just beat our breasts over the population issue we have to recognize that it is related to resource extraction and it is a problem driven by the consuming policies of the high tech industrial democracy Well, when this trilogue began, I sure didn't expect it to end with a discussion of global capitalism. And uh, I find it interesting that Terence's more optimistic view of the future, at least uh, relative to the then current financial crisis, actually uh, held up at least when compared to Rupert's more gloomy outlook. But what is also interesting to me is that uh, in the short run, Rupert was uh, more in tune with events. Now, keep in mind that this trilogue was held in 1998, uh, just before the dot-com bubble burst. However, uh, over the long haul, uh, at least so far, the establishment has been able to keep a lid on this uh, house of cards they call global capitalism. Of course, uh, the game isn't over until the casino closes. Now, uh, there is one thing that I feel compelled to clear up right now. And that is the concept of uploading ourselves, or downloading as Terence thought of it, into a computer where a few subjective minutes in the default world could seem like a thousand years when run through a very fast CPU. Well, coincidentally, uh, just before I began to review this talk, I was on the phone with Bruce Damer and uh, somehow the topic of uh, uploading consciousness into silicone came up. And in just a few short minutes, Bruce was uh, able to explain to me why this isn't even close to the realm of technical feasibility right now. And until then, I, I had kind of gone along with Greg Egan's fantasy world of uh, human consciousness being preserved in a computer uh, that he wrote about in Permutation City. But to tell the truth, I had uh, never really given any serious thought as to how one would do it and uh, what the specs would be for a machine that uh, could hold my thoughts. But uh, this is an area where Bruce has spent a considerable amount of time looking into the problem, and uh, basically he brought to an end my fantasy of living forever in a computer chip. But now, uh, instead of me trying to explain Bruce's thoughts on this subject, uh, I asked him if he would just say it again one more time and record it, and uh, I'm happy to say that he most graciously complied. And uh, I'd like to play that for you right now. About this consciousless uploading thing or downloading thing, well, let's take a look at it. You know, in the field of molecular dynamics, where they simulate individual molecules forming from atoms and those molecules interacting, did you know that it, for simulating, say, a very, very small volume of virtual chemicals, maybe like a, a, a cubic millimeter, and this is very small, uh, and simulating all the reactions, they're now building supercomputers that will run you know, flat out with thousands of processors to simulate a microsecond of reaction time uh, in, in this artificial chemistry. Well, think about that. A microsecond, now how long will this take? Weeks, weeks or months. So consider that. Consider how densely computational reality is. Now this is simulation at what's known as, as we said earlier, the molecular dynamics level. You could simulate also at the quantum dynamics level, a little bit lower, and get even more dense information. So nature is 
amazingly computationally intensive. So roll your clocks forward. Think about uh, what would it take to simulate a complete cell. Now that's a pretty small volume too, but there's amazingly complex machinery in there. And if you talk to any biologists in the computational space and they look at uh, one day the possibility of simulating one cell, uh, it's it's something that is years or decades hence. Uh, this is something off the charts for the largest computing grids to do reliably and to synchronize all the computers to get the different parts of the simulated cell to, to work together so that it beha behaves like a real cell. So the DNA nucleus, the ribosomes and ribozymes and, and the protein mechanisms and all the organelles and the membrane. I mean, that's, that's a lot of machinery. Now, if you think about it that way, and that's the real stuff, uh, for those who believe that uh, one day and relatively soon, relatively around the corner, we're going to somehow upload or download our consciousness into some kind of silicon environment. Well, they don't really have the math right. They don't really have the understanding of the complexity of the machinery of the human brain. So, for instance, how would you represent uh, the human brain with its hundreds of millions of cells nerve cells with dendritic connections and thousands of connections per nerve cell that go across uh, to other cells. Did you know that the number of pathways in the human brain uh, between the different nerve cells, the number of distinct pathways through it has been estimated to be larger than the number of countable particles in the universe? So... <clears throat> Looking at all that, if we have trouble even conceiving of how to build a simulation of a single cell uh, to to work reliably as a, as a basically as something testable in biology, and people are now just thinking of building simulations of small spaces of chemistry, like cell, like for instance, across a cell membrane, for example, which would be very very valuable for all kinds of bio biomedical research. How can we even conceive of building something in silicon that would represent even the tiniest measurable fraction of the complexity of the computing machinery that is the human brain or any any animal's brain? How can we even conceive of that? It's 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 in a sense this this concept of uploading and downloading a consciousness is certainly in the realm of fantasy, but it's not. It's, it doesn't even require us to give it any due, any airtime. It's so it's so absurd. Uh, we can look back in the late 19th century or into the early 20th century when, you know, steam-powered or electric-powered automata were being brought out and paraded in public venues. Remember, there's a, a sequence at the New York World's Fair of 1939-40, there, there was a, a mechanical guy that was run by various servos and whatnot. And, of course, people projected onto that guy and said, well, gee, you know, um, having a human, an artificial human with uh, intentions, feelings, whatever, is just around the corner. And we look back at those films and, and that thinking and think how absurd these people are. But we are no less absurd by thinking that we're going to be placing something as complex as consciousness or replicating even a tiny fraction of the human brain. So rolling the clock forward a little bit more, there's another school of thought called the singularity, which says also that, well, uh, there will be enough self-organizing complexity and technology that one day it will all become conscious and it'll all roll forward, and it's kind of the the backwards version of the downloading equation. It's saying, well, consciousness will emerge on its own anyway in these networks, and you know we're we're a done deal because it won't need us anymore. 
This is also a very popular idea in science fiction, and it's an idea that should stay in science fiction, because it's really the same thing in reverse. So what kind of silicon and what kind of software is going to represent something that can come to consciousness? It's the same problem. If it's something that's equivalent to an animal, even a simple animal on the surface of the earth, it's way beyond the capabilities of of the silicon to do that. And who's going to program this? Is it going to emerge spontaneously from Microsoft Office? Is Microsoft Word suddenly going to be start to to write words for you? Is it going to have an AI in there and an, an AI module will add a new button that will that will write your every utterance in the future? I think this happened in an Edgar Allan Poe horror story at some point. So it's really the same it's the same argument or the same claim, which is also, you know, quite absurd. So in a sense, looking at all this, um, you know, what what does it take to even get to the first step? Well in the project that I've been involved with for a couple of years called the Evo Grid or the Evolution Grid, we're just trying to figure out pathways to create an artificial chemistry that can show a little bit of emergence of biologically interesting phenomena that might lead one day to a bigger simulation where we could show sort of prototypical, you know, artificial biological structures that might get put together into what you would call a truly emergent artificial life or, a you know, a predecessor to any uh, truly formed artificial life. So... This is a project that I conceive will last for decades because the problems are so difficult. So the real the real projects, the real efforts to create things that are a little bit like biology and nature in technology are very hard. There are very few of them going on. Most of technology is is tinker toy assembly for various, you know, mundane purposes. Um, such as playing an MP3 file for you or vacuuming your room. There's no in- intelligence or consciousness coming from those projects. So there are very few projects actually tackling things close to what might what might be thought of as the singularity or downloading consciousness. So we there's a whole class of people who can talk about this all the time, but they're not actually working on the on the problems. So. In a sense, if those people started to work on these problems, they would probably stop talking about this. And they would say, you know what, we've concluded that this is so difficult and there's so many unknowns that, frankly, we were just, you know, we were talking science fiction fantasy here. And we apologize if we got anyone uh, ruffled or upset. So anyway, that's just one opinion uh, and viewpoint from the trenches here on this uh, concept of downloading, uploading consciousnesses and the singularity. Bruce Damer signing off. You're listening to the Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. Well, so there you have it. And uh, while I'm sure that some of our fellow saloners would like to take issue with some of Bruce's opinions, it would uh, have to take a lot of convincing for me to, again, spend my time uh, thinking about uploading my consciousness during a singularity or something like that. But uh, my lame jokes aside, uh, I do want to thank Bruce for taking the time to record that uh, little soundbite for us and to move the conversation about this topic onto a more solid footing. I uh, also would like to mention that uh, just two months after the talk we just heard, uh, Terrence and Ralph gave a uh, two-hour presentation at Omega Institute that they titled The World Wide Web and the Millennium. And uh, you can hear that discussion in my podcasts uh, number 19 and 20, which uh, I produced about five years ago, I guess. But uh, it's uh, still a really interesting conversation in case you haven't heard it already. Now, there's one more recording from this trialog session, and I'll try to get that out in the next few days. But before I go, I'd like to read part of an email I received on Facebook the other day from a fellow saloner. And uh, here's part of what this saloner had to say. 
Hi, Lorenzo. I have a story to share and a warning concerning curanderos traveling Europe and conducting ayahuasca sessions. A friend of mine recently got invited to an ayahuasca circle with an Ecuadorian shaman. Having no experiences with major psychedelics, he discussed the idea of participating in this circle with me. I uh, did some research on Arrowwood and other sources on the quality of these traveling shaman, and I found a lot of testimonies on positive and powerful experiences. So we decided to give it a shot. The event was quite expensive, but this seemed to me a good chance to meet the others. Very little info was given to us on the ceremony, but we got the dietary requirements and a FAQ on MAOIs. We started the diet at one week in advance. To get our focus on the ordeal, we were soon to experience. I had a lot of conversations with my friend about the do's and don'ts of psychedelics to make sure he was well prepared. The day before the ceremony, I fell ill and, with a sad heart, decided that in my state I was not fit to participate in an all-night ceremony. It felt like a terrible waste to not attend after a week of the diet, but my respect for the medicine kept me from it. My friend decided to attend on his own and went to the ceremony the next day. Of the ceremony, I only have his account, but I find this quite interesting and disturbing. Arriving at the camp area, he found the place disorganized. The ceremony was supposed to start at 2100, but was delayed to 2300 because of poor planning. Since all the participants had been fasting since 0300, the two extra hours of waiting felt like an eternity. There also seemed to be a lot of confusion around the ritual setting, direction of participants, etc. The circle consisted of 30 people, many of whom had never tried any psychoactive material, except caffeine, nicotine, etc. And the information given was poor. Shortly after the ayahuasca had been ingested, a woman in the circle got what can only be described as a panic attack. She was not allowed or given help. This concerns me deeply. I know ayahuasca is a very comforting and powerful hallucinogen. This makes it even more important to help and support participants. The so-called sitters all drank the brew and were of no help to the group whatsoever. It was a rough ride for many people in the group and the ceremony lasted until 0900 the next morning. Participants were not allowed to go to sleep when they felt necessary. My friend, on the other hand, got through the experience unharmed, sticking with the basic psychedelic rules I had coached him in. But after the ceremony, he was filled with anger toward the organizers, seeing them as frauds and opportunists, and he felt suspicious of the shaman. Knowing the stories of shaman and their staring through your soul personalities, it seems unlikely that this was an especially skilled one. My point of telling you this story is that these kinds of gatherings may cause serious damage to the unprepared, seeing how little information was given to the beginners and how little guidance was given by the shaman slash sitters. It can also give a lot of bad press to psychedelic plants, something which we don't need. In your podcast number 89, I think it was, you discussed ayahuasca as a possible first-time psychedelic experience, but point out that you should speak with someone who has participated in the ceremony with this shaman before. I think this story underlies the importance of this. Well, uh, I want to thank our fellow Slaughter that sent this in to me uh, very much for passing this along because uh, it is important information, I believe. And uh, this story, I think, uh, should probably serve as a warning to anyone who's thinking about participating in one of these circles. Personally, uh, I would never attend a session unless I had a close friend whose opinions I respected, by the way, uh, tell me that they had already had an experience with a particular Iowa Scaro. And in most cases, I would uh, actually want more than one recommendation. You know, there's no rush here. Uh, Mother Ayahuasca will find you when you're ready. So don't force the issue. Uh, you'll, you'll know if the situation feels right. And uh, if it doesn't, then, uh, hey, screw up your courage and uh, get the heck out of there. This uh, isn't a uh, recreational experience. And uh, so it isn't to be toyed with. Just uh, be really careful here because, uh, hey, we need you for the long haul, too. Well, that should do it for now, and uh, so I'll close today's podcast by reminding you that this and most of the podcasts from the Psychedelic Salon are freely available for you to use in uh, your own audio projects under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. And uh, if you have any questions about that, just uh, click the Creative Commons link at the bottom of the Psychedelic Salon webpage, which you can find at psychedelicsalon.org. 
And uh, if you're interested in the philosophy behind the Psychedelic Salon, you can hear all about it in my novel, The Genesis Generation, which is available as an audiobook that uh, you can download at genesisgeneration.us. And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends. <laughs>